This lesson is validating data annotations programmatically in C Sharp. The objectives for this lesson are to build a console application, add a required attribute, build a reusable helper class, and try out our data validation. Let's first start out by creating a console application using Visual Studio 2022. Next, I'll show you how to do it with Visual Studio Code. Bring up Visual Studio 2022 and click on Create a New Project. If you need to, search for Console App and choose the one that is a project for creating a command line application that can run on .NET, on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Don't choose the one for the .NET framework. Click Next. Let's give it a name of Data Annotations Samples and place it in whatever location that you would like. Make sure you choose a later version such as .NET 6, .NET 7, or optimally .NET 8. Go ahead and click the Create button, and you now have a console application that is ready to go. Let's now take a look at how you would create a console application using VS Code if you wish to use that utility instead of Visual Studio 2022. Bring up Visual Studio Code. Go to Terminal, New Terminal, and I like all of my projects on my D drive, so I'm going to go down to my Samples folder. I'm going to make a new directory called Data Annotation Samples. I'll then go ahead and navigate in to that, and now from here I will type in .NET New console, and I'm going to use framework net 8.0. And this then just creates a project for me that I can start working with. So I'm going to go ahead and open the folder. I'll go over to my D drive, samples, data annotation samples, and I'll select that folder. And it'll bring up some things. It'll actually bring in some C-sharp stuff so we're ready to go. You can see it happening down here in the output window. All right, so now we're ready. We have this program.cs. Looks exactly the same as what we had in Visual Studio. I don't care which one you use. I'm going to be using Visual Studio, but feel free to use VS Code if you're more familiar with that. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to build our validation helper class. And to do that, we're going to need three classes. And we need these three classes to perform our own data annotation validation. The first one is the validation context. This is just simply a class that holds the object to be validated. We have the validator class, which has a try validate object method. We pass in the object to be validated along with the instance of our validation context. And then what we get back is a list of validation result objects that's filled with any validation messages. Now this validation result class has an error message property. It's a string data type, of course. And the error message is what is used to describe why the property value failed the validation, just like we saw in that first sample that I ran. It then has also a member names property. Now this is a string array data type contains a list of one or more member names for which that validation failed. Now, typically, it only contains a single property name associated with the error message. It's only in very outlying kind of edge cases would you ever have more than one member name associated with an error message. So let's take a look at creating our validation helper class. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to right mouse click on the project. We're going to add a new folder called Validation Classes. It's into this folder that we're going to then create a class called Validation Helper. And that was that name of what we used before. Now, instead of typing it all in here, I'm going to go ahead and just throw the code in here because it's not a lot of code. At the very top, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in the system.componentmodel.dataannotations. That's where these classes that I described in this PowerPoints live. We're going to put this under a namespace called common.library, because this is going to be something you'll be able to use over and over again. I'm going to create a public static class called validation helper. And then within this region, I'm just creating a, a line 13 public static list validation result validate. It's a generic, so you're going to pass in any type of entity where the entity is a class. So I'm assuming it's a class that has data annotations on it, of course. 
Line 15, I create a return value, which will be that list of validation results. We then, on line 18, create an instance of this validation context. I'm going to call that variable context and set it equal to new, passing in our entity that we're passing in to our validate method. We're then going to use the validator class, call it static method called try validate object, passing in our entity and that context along with that list of validation results because it's going to fill all of that up or it's going to come back with an empty list if everything passed. So then we return that out of our validate method here. Well, now that we have the validate helper, we need a class to validate. So let's add and validate a product class. Let's go back to our project and let's add another new folder. This one will be called Entity Classes. And it's inside of here that we'll add our product class. We'll go ahead and add that. And again, I'm just going ahead and create a small little class here. So it's in the namespace, data annotation samples. It's a public, I made it partial. It doesn't really matter for this particular application, but I did that anyway. And it's a class called product. And you can see I have a product ID, a name, a product number, a color, standard cost, list price, sell start date, sell end date, discontinued date. And then I have a two string override, which just returns the name and the product ID. Let's now go back over to program.cs and I'm going to put some code in here that we're going to use throughout the rest of this course. So the first thing, I'm going to bring in my common library. That's where the validation helper class is. I'm going to bring in my data annotation samples. That's where the product class is. And of course, I'm going to bring in the system.componentmodel.data annotations. In line five, I'm going to create a list of validation result. Remember, that's going to be what comes back from my validate method that we wrote. In line seven through 17, this is like what we saw in the last lesson where we create our product entity and we assign some data into it. So it's the same data that we saw before. The name's empty, the product number is empty, the color's empty. But what you notice is that in the product class, I didn't add any data annotations yet. That's fine. Then on line 19, we call our validation helper dot validate passing in our entity. We then check to see if we got any messages coming back. If I have a count of messages greater than zero, I know that there are some validation messages. So let's go ahead and iterate over that collection and we'll write them out onto the council. At the very end, we'll display the total validations that failed. If there are no messages that come back, that means the entity is valid and we'll put that out onto the council. Let's go ahead and run this now. And we should see that the entity is valid because there were no data annotations. So we're going to start out with the required attribute. We'll add that to our product class. Now, the required attribute ensures that the user fills in a value into a property. So we add this attribute above any property that we want the user to fill in. And the default validation message that comes back is the, and then whatever the property name field is required. Let's take a look at using the required attribute. So let's go up above our name property. Okay, and we'll do required. Now you'll see it gives us a little squiggly, but if you drop down the little, or little light bulb there, it'll say using system.componentmodel.data annotations. And that's exactly what we need. We'll put that above the name, the product number, and the color for now. Now that we've done that, if we go back to program.cs, you can see on lines 9 through 11 that those are empty. So that means that there's no data in them. That means when I run this now, we are going to get those default messages. The name field is required. The product number field is required. The color field is required. Before we get into looking at further details of required and other data annotations, I wanted to mention some other useful return values that you might want to add to the validation helper class. That list of validation result objects can be a little bit difficult to deal with sometimes, because if you think about it, that member names is a string array. What if you wanted to bind the error message and the property name? Well, it'd be hard to access that property name in the string array because you never know it's going to be there, or even if it's going to have more than one. So instead, you might want to create your own validation message class and return that as a list. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. Also, in web API applications, 
you may want to return a dictionary of a string and a string array. So it kind of matches the validation result. But the reason you do that is because, especially in the minimal web API, it's easy to serialize a dictionary like this into a 400 problem JSON object. There's an actual method that you can call to create this problem, which is a return that people know about for validation errors. For more information on this, see my minimal web API development course. So let's go take a look at just adding these other methods to our validation helper class before we continue on. Right mouse click on the validation classes folder and let's add a class called validation message. Now this one's going to be easier to bind to because as you can see, we're simply going to have a single property name and a single error message properties. So those two properties make it very easy to bind. Then all we have to do is we have to open up our validation helper class and we'll add another method down here. And this method is going to be called validate to validation message. The return value from this is simply list of validation message. On line 38, we call the validate that we just looked at. It's going to return those validation result objects. If there are any validation results returned, we'll go ahead and iterate over those results. We will then go into that member names, we'll convert it to an array, and we'll grab the first item out of there. That's the property name. Then on line 50, we can add to our list of validation message objects a new property name equals that prop name, and the error message can be item.error message, or if it happens to be null, which it never should be, we can simply say unknown validation error. So we iterate all over, over all of the validation results, we turn them into validation messages, and that's what then gets returned from this method. As I mentioned, there's another method that we might want to add. And this one I have called validate to dictionary. And as you can see, it's going to return that dictionary of a string, comma, string array. Like I said, pretty much closely matches the list of validation results. We still do the same thing. We validate the entity. We then check to see if there are any results that come back. We iterate over those results and we use the same code to grab the property name and then we create a new instance of our dictionary using the property name and a new string array with the item.error message, or if that's not filled in, unknown validation error. And then that dictionary object is what gets returned. So now we have a couple of other methods that, trust me, will come in handy. I use these all the time in my web API applications and in my WPF applications. In this lesson, we created a council application and we built a nice reusable validation helper class. We applied the required attribute and we performed the validation to see the error messages. Coming up next, adding the error message property to the required attribute.